All right, so I see many of you have your Bibles, which is a good thing. We're going to have a lot of scripture verses, so don't try to keep up with me. I'm going to go through them kind of quick, but if you have a piece of paper, you can write down the uh, actual um, verses uh, because they will be up there. I, um, I'm going to ask you to consider two questions before we start, so you can think about this as uh, we're moving through this. The first question is, what would your definition of a saint be? What would your definition of a saint be? And the other question is, what does it take to be a saint? So those are the two questions to ponder. Now, most people think of a saint as someone who was declared a saint by the church and someone who is now in heaven. We think of a saint as someone who is super pious and holy while on earth. And for the most part, we think of a saint as someone not really so much like us. So this evening, guess what we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about the saints. We're going to talk about what the church teaches about saints, what scripture says about it, how we can enlist the saints in our prayer, and how praying to the saints is not in any way a form of worship. We're going to discuss about how the church teaches about the relics of saints. We're going to look into some of the scripture passages that speak specifically to relics, how relics are classified. I brought with me a bunch of relics. And I'll set that up in between when we take our break. This is going to be an opportunity uh, for you to, if you have a rosary or a medal, some kind of a thing that would draw you into prayer or help you be mindful of prayer and touch it to a uh, first class relic and it will become a third-class relic. All right? So, if you look in the uh, catechism of the Catholic Church, and you were to go to the back at the index, and look up saint, it would say, see holiness. So, scripture generally, and Luke specifically, we come to understand that holiness is not something that we self-possess because we cannot make ourselves holy. We cannot make ourselves a saint. But holiness is something that speaks of our relationship with the one who is holy. In fact, in the Magnificat, we hear the Blessed Mother saying that her soul magnifies the Lord. And that her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior. And then she goes on to name, give the name of her Savior. She says, for he is mighty who has done great things for me, and holy is his name. So all Christians in any state of life are called to the fullness of the Christian Christian faith. We're all called to holiness. So I want you to remember those two questions because we're going to come back to them. All right. So let's take a, a look at the biblical portrait of a saint. <clears throat> so in scripture, a saint is a person who is a believer, a believer in Jesus Christ. It is a person who is striving to live a holy life. A person who is living in a state of grace. And therefore is consecrated to God. So holiness extends to whoever is in a relationship with God. It includes the idea, and this is very important, the idea of being separated from or in opposition to whatever is profane, to whatever is common. 
It expresses the idea of belonging to, is actually being possessed by God. So St. Paul calls all fellow believers saints. And in his letter to the Ephesians, he says, so, so then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. That means all other believers and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ himself, who is the cornerstone. St. Paul clearly uses... So before I get into that, i got to follow my own notes. So, why does St. Paul so often call fellow believers in Jesus, saints, or sometimes the Greek word is the holy ones. It's because St. Paul is placing before the faithful a vision, a goal. Paul wants them to identify themselves as already being saints. Because if they can conceive themselves as saints, by God's grace, they can achieve it as well. So think of this analogy. If a coach for a football team were to always refer to his players as champions, it's not that they have already won a championship, but by getting them to envision and to identify themselves as being champions, then little by little they begin to do the things that will help them become champions. Because if we can't even conceive ourselves as being saints, then we will by default accept being less, and oftentimes being much less. As parents and as grandparents, we must not only place that vision and that goal for our children of being a saint, but we too must do all the things to be the type of person that by God's grace can help us to be saints. So here's some examples. So we see how in these two um, letters that St. Paul writes, he greets um, the Ephesians saying that you're no longer strangers and sojourners, but fellow citizens with the saints, other believers, and members of the household of God. And then in, in to, uh, the next one he says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. So this is really interesting because what we see here is St. Paul is saying that believers have infiltrated, if you will, even the highest level of society, that they're even in the household of Caesar. And it's a prefigurement of the universality of the Christian life, which will eventually spread across the world. So Paul calls all fellow believer saints, not just the, the real holy ones, but he uses that same terminology for both the living and the dead. He writes his letter, the second letter he writes to the Thessalonians, he says, those or these who do not acknowledge God nor heed the good news will pay the penalty of eternal ruin, separated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified among the saints, that means of all the believers, and to be marveled at on that day among all who have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. So he's making the connection between those who had already 
passed on and those who are currently living. So this practice of Paul corresponds to our creed. In the Apostle Creed, we say how we believe in the communion of saints. So the communion of saints refers to that bond, that bond of unity among all believers, both living and dead, all committed followers of Jesus Christ. So in the eyes of the eternal God, the distinction between his people who are living and his people who have died really makes no difference to him. How do we know that? How do we know that, it, that he doesn't make that distinction? So how many here know the story of the transfiguration? Most of you, I hope. We see that at the Lord's transfiguration, those who had died centuries before and those who are currently living were both there at the same time. On the Mount of Tabor, we have Peter, James, and John with Jesus during his transfiguration. And then the scripture tells us that Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Now Moses had died about 1,400 years before that. Elijah died about 800 years before that. And yet, we have Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Tabor, and there is Jesus talking to Moses and talking to Elijah. You see, to God, who is the God of the living, not of the dead, he doesn't make a distinction. Again, we see in the Gospel of Mark, the Sadducees try to test Jesus because they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so they gave him like a hypothetical. And Jesus, of course, was always smarter than everybody else, right? He knew what they were trying to do. They're trying to prove in some way that there's no resurrection. And Jesus says, as for the dead being raised... Have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God told Moses, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And then he says to the Sadducees, you see, you're really quite wrong about denying the resurrection. So, Vatican II, which was an ecumenical council back in the early 60s. And when they were done, they wrote on the church. And this is one of the things written in there. At the present time, some of Jesus' disciples are pilgrims on earth. That's us. Pilgrims on earth. Others have died and are being purified. Those are in purgatory. Well, still others are in glory, beholding clearly God himself three in one as he is. So I have a question. I'm, I'm hoping someone's going to know the answer to this. Does anyone know what the traditional classifications are for the three groups that make up the uh, communion of saints? There are three groups. Anybody? So I don't know that this is taught anymore. Church militant, that's us. Great. Those in heaven are church triumphant. Those that are in purgatory, church sorrowful. So, very good. All together we came up with them. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that the life of each of God's children is joined in Christ and through Christ in a wonderful way to the life of all other Christian brethren in the supernatural unity of the mystical body of Christ. It's as though we are a single mystical person. 
So, because I mentioned how the translation of um, through Paul and through the Greek, so let's look at holiness, because that's another way to translate uh, the word for a saint. So, we're going to go through these um, in the first letter of Peter. And he who called you is holy. Be holy yourselves in every aspect of your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. In Hebrews, strive for peace with everyone. For that holiness without which no one can see the Lord. For that holiness without which no one can see the Lord. The first letter to the Thessalonians, this is the will of God, your holiness. So be perfect, just as the Heavenly Father is perfect, we read in the Gospel of Matthew. So let's look now at the role of a saint. Saints are presented to believers to be a role model and also someone that's worthy of being imitated. Now, I've already talked about how St. Paul uses saint to refer to those that are in heaven and those that are still alive here on earth. So if we're going to be a saint, then we too need to be a role model. We too need to be someone that's worthy of having others imitate. In the letter in Hebrews, we read, so that you may not be sluggish, be imitators of those through faith and patience are inheriting the promise. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us. Now, I, when I first read this about Paul, uh, where Paul says in the Corinthians, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. So initially you say, be imitators of me. Why is Paul saying that? That's because Paul so identified himself with Christ that he wouldn't live a life that was any way contrary to the life of Christ. And so he knew that that's what we were all called to do and so he can say, be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Join with others in being imitators of me, brothers and sisters, and observe those who thus conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. So we're going back now to Vatican II on the church. For when we look at the lives of those who have faithfully followed Christ, we are inspired with a new reason for seeking the city which is to come. At the same time, we are shown a most safe path by which we will be able to arrive at the perfect union with Christ, that is holiness. How many here would want to know for sure what the path is to get to heaven? without any doubt, Jesus Christ. Imitate Jesus Christ. And I'm going to talk to you in a moment after I get your feedback on the question of what does it take to be a saint. That's a really important question. So we all know as Catholics that we can seek the intercession of the saints, right? As part of, the, our, of their belief in the role of the saints, as professed in the Apostle Creed, Catholics petition the intercession of the saints. Saint Paul frequently asked other fellow believers to pray for him. In Colossians, pray for us that God may open a door to us for the word to speak of the mystery of Christ. And then in the Romans, join me in the struggle by your prayers to God on my behalf. The anointing of the sick. We read in James, is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyter, which is the priest, and they should pray over him and anoint him with the oil in the name of the Lord. So, 
Prayer appears to be a normal way of believers on earth to support one another, right? We ask people, and I'm sure you've all asked someone to pray for me or pray for someone in your family, or you've been asked to pray for someone. Catholics believe that we can ask fellow Christians, saints, to pray for us. To, we should be able to ask prayers from the saints who are already with God in heaven. Because if the prayers of certain Christians here on earth seem to possess special power because of their great faith witness, then how much more powerful are the prayers of the saints in heaven who are fully united with God? So many non-Catholics, they misunderstand us when we mention that we pray to a particular saint or we pray to Mary for an intercession. The church, and in fact, the common understanding of prayer from the beginning of Christianity is that prayer is a sort of communication. It is a means by which we direct our conversation. When we pray, we are directing our conversation to the one to whom we are speaking. And so if we ask St. Anthony to intercede for us, we're not at all worshiping St. Anthony. We're not doing anything that is an affront to God. We are, in fact, directing our prayer to St. Anthony, asking for his intercession. When we, and certainly the same with um, any saint, but the Blessed Mother especially. So worship is entirely different. And we're going to go into that in just a minute. So, I'm not going to go through what the whole system is for canonizing a saint. But the word canon comes from the Greek word canon, meaning a standard or a measuring rod. So, contrary to the belief of some, the church does not create saints. It's not like they're going to make a saint but simply applies the standard of gospel holiness. And they come to know, God allows the church to know that this person, because of the miracles and because of their heroic virtue, that they're in heaven. So one of the ways is through the performance of miracles, attributed to the intercession of a saint. So it goes through a long process and the person under consideration, if they successfully are declared a saint, must, first of all, what's the first thing they have to do? They have to die. You have to die first before you can become a declared saint. And normally you have to wait five years before anything can be done. Although the, book, the Pope can change that if he wants. And so you go from servant of God to venerable to blessed and then declared a saint. It takes two confirmed supernatural miracles in order um, through the intercession of a saint, of a person to become a saint. So in the early church it was by popular acclamation. So there was the church didn't do anything for the apostles that say okay we went through this rigorous uh, process and okay the apostles are a saint it was by popular acclamation everybody knew that they were saints because of their life total devotion to Jesus Christ the power and the grace of the Holy Spirit on them in so many different ways and we know I mean we're here because of the apostles but over time they began to follow a standard of holiness of life, the heroic virtue, right? And it's a, la a lengthy process of prayer and study in order to actually canonize a saint. So a miracle is a supernatural, is supernatural because the effect is beyond the power of nature and applies a, um, implies a supernatural influence. 
So St. Thomas Aquinas, which was really a smart guy, said, miracles are supernatural because they are beyond the order or laws of the whole created nature. So basically, the miraculous effect is beyond the present knowledge and power of any medical or any physical science to explain it. So when somebody is miraculously healed, and they go to the doctors, and they have to say, okay, look at this is all the things we know for sure. They had all of this stuff. There was one, a deacon, by the matter of fact, who um, could not stand, he was like this. I mean, he could not stand up. And he was going through diaconal formation, and he was watching EWTN. And they said that... Um, John Henry Newman, right? That if you, if you have, pray for his intercession. And if you have any kind of a, like a miraculous cure, let us know. And so he's in uh, diaconal formation. He's in such pain, he really can't even make it to the classes and the stuff that he has to do. And so he specifically asked St. John Henry Newman, please intercede for me so I can make it through formation. And he, like, I don't know if it happened instantaneous or the next day, but he got to the point where he could stand up completely erect. He made it right through formation. And shortly thereafter, so you have to be careful of your prayers, exactly how you ask. <laughs> so he took them very literal. He made it through formation. So he was in the hospital. He's going to have surgery. He had surgery before. And he wanted to get out of bed uh, at the hospital. And he was really in a lot of pain. And so he did ask um, John Henry Newman to intercede for him again. And he could barely get out of bed. Instantaneously, the pain was gone. He's actually going up and down the stairs, down the hallway that very day. He was miraculously healed. He is to this day the same. He's it's never had a problem. There's no sign of surgery. This is the power of God. This is the power of the intercession of saints. So, I have no doubt. I actually met him. He was at the church I, I was at before I became a deacon. He stood um, with the relic of St. John Henry Newman uh, as people came up to venerate the relic, touch. He was there like, I don't know, hours. And you know, if you have a back problem, you can't stand for hours. But he was totally healed. So, what is a relic? It is an object connected with a saint, part of the body or clothing or something that the person used or touched. So this actually describes both a first and a second class relic. So there are three classes of relics. A first class relic is a part of the saint's body and is the type that's placed in an altar. So we have relics in our altar upstairs. A second class relic is a part of the clothing or anything used during the saint's life. There's, at the end I'm gonna talk about a particular saint which is kind of funny when you're talking about the clothing. A third class relic is any object such as a piece of cloth that has been touched to a first-class relic. So here are first-class relics. And if you touch your cross or a medal, um, it becomes a third-class relic. Now somebody will say, well, if I touch it with my hand, does my hand become a third-class relic? Right, that's a pretty good question. The answer is no. Why? Because you don't use your hand as an object to draw your closer to God. 
you don't look at your hand and think that somehow that's an object of reverence, right? But a cross, a, a rosary, a medal, those are like sacramentals which help draw your mind and your heart to God. So does the first commandment forbid us to honor the saints in heaven? So there's a long and a, a cherished tradition of the Catholic understanding of the veneration of saints, relics, and sacred images. But all the same, there's a question that's often asked about the practice of honoring saints and seeking their intercession. The question is often in relation to perceived violation of the first commandment. So the church says, the first commandment does not forbid us to honor the saints in heaven provided we do not give them the honor that belongs to God alone. And that comes from the Baltimore Catechism, which this is even before my time, that you actually had to memorize the responses to questions such as that. The question being, does the first commandment forbid us to honor the saints in heaven? And if you were in school at the time that you had to memorize this, you, said, you would have to say correctly, the first commandment does not forbid us so you'd have to memorize the whole thing of the Baltimore Catechism. But that was just before, before me. So I'm still pretty young. So what's the difference? The difference is more than in mere degrees. There is a major difference in the kind of honor given. So the Latin word dulia so it signifies the honor that we give to the saints. Hyperdulia signifies the high honor that we give to the Blessed Virgin Mary. It is substantially less than that which we give to God, but it is higher than that which we give to the angels and the saints. And then the last one is a completely different word, latria. It is the supreme honor, worship, and adoration that is to do, do to God alone. So images, statues, relics are not in and of themselves capable of doing anything except cause the transcendence of our heart and our soul to God himself and to the saints who intercede on our behalf. So let's look at what the church actually teaches. The honor given to a relic does not stop at the sacred object itself, but is directed to the person whose relic is venerated. We honor Christ and the saints when we pray before the crucifix, relics, and sacred images because we honor the person they represent. We, we adore Christ. We venerate the saints. In venerating relics, statues, and pictures of our Lord and the saints, we must not believe that any divine power resides in them, nor should we put our trust in them as though they had the power of themselves to bestow favors. We place our trust in God in the intercessory power of the saints. So our relics and the use of relics scriptural. Let's look at the Old Testament. In Exodus 13, there we read, And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt equipped for battle. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For Joseph, Joseph had solemnly sworn the people of Israel, saying, God will visit you, then you must carry my bones with you from here. That should make us understand that the body is a sacred um, creation of God. So we are body and soul. So the idea that somehow we could treat the body however we want to is not true. And that's why we know that from the moment of conception, that child is a human being worthy of all protection 
and honor. In Sirach 48, it was Elijah who was covered by a whirlwind, and Elijah was filled with his spirit. In all his days, he did not tremble before any ruler, and no one brought him into subjection. Nothing was too hard for him. And when he was dead, his body prophesied. And in his life, he did wonders. And after death, his deeds were marvelous. In 2 Kings, we pick up where Elijah is now filled with twice the power of the Holy Spirit and uses the same mantle that Elijah had. Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven, and Elijah took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him, and he stood at the Jordan River. And he took that mantle, and he struck the river, and it, the water was parted on both sides. Do we recall something else in Scripture where that happened? Right? Moses parted the Red Sea. Well, here it happened with Elijah. And he used the mantle. A little further in 2 Kings, we see how the actual occasion for the reference that we just saw was written about in the book of Sirach. So Elijah died, and he was buried. And then there was this band of Moabites, right? And they're inv inv um, invading the land. And they were going to bury this guy, a guy. And they saw this band. And what they did is they threw the body into the grave where Elijah was. As soon as a man touched the bones of Elijah, the man was revived and he stood on his feet. That was because he touched the bones of Elijah. In Mark, the Gospel of Mark, we know the story about the woman who had 12 years had a hemorrhage and had heard that about Jesus and came behind him in the crowd and she said to herself, if she just touched his garment, she would be cured. And then immediately upon touching it, her flow of blood dried up. So she didn't touch Jesus himself, just his garment. In the Acts of the Apostles, we know that is written in St. Luke as an account of a very early Christian church. Paul, of course, is, has a very prominent place in the church and a in, huge impact on spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and evil spirits came out of them. So this is from Scripture. We, you can go to the Bible if you wrote those Scripture verses down and read just what I wrote. We looked at the use of relics in the earliest church as accounted by St. Luke. So now we need to look and see, so what happened after the apostles? What happened in the early church? How did they regard relics? So one is St. Polycarp. Now he was a disciple of St. John. So he learned about Jesus directly from the apostle. He was the bishop of Smyrna. And so he had no fear. He knew there was a resurrection. So the proconsul was going to have him burned alive. But Polycarp, he wasn't going to say, okay, I, I um, renounce Jesus Christ because he wasn't afra afraid to die. And so they lit the fire, and they say that the flames kind of went around St. Polycarp, kind of like a sail, and he became kind of like bread, baked bread. Um, but instead of being burned, he just glowed. When the captors saw this, being, that he wasn't being burned, then they stabbed him, and the blood that flowed out put the fire out. But that's not the point of, my, of telling you about this. This is what the, um, the believer said. We took up his bones, 
which are more valuable than precious stones and finer than the refined gold, and laid them in a suitable place where the Lord will permit us to gather ourselves together as we are able in gladness and joy and celebrate the birthday of his martyrdom. So they right there knew that relics were something that could help them uh, so they could venerate the relics uh, for the intercession of St. Polycarp. So at the Council of Trent, the teaching of the Catholic Church with regard to the veneration of relics is that the holy bodies of holy martyrs and others now living with Christ are to be venerated by the faithful for through these bodies many benefits are bestowed by God on men. They who affirm that veneration and honor are not due to the relics of the saints or honored by the faithful are wholly to be condemned as the church has already long since condemned and also now condemned. So for those who are saying that somehow is sacrilegious to venerate relics or to seek the intercession of saints, they're to be roundly condemned. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you're talking to somebody and having a friendly conversation that you say, you're condemned, because <laughs> Council Trent said so. So we're going to look at St. Martin de Porres. That's, his, that's the icon of him at the bottom there. So that box there, my brother actually made for me for these relics. He's a very good woodworker. So I have a relic of St. Martin de Porres. So he was a great saint of compassion and selfless love. He was born of a Spanish father and a freed Negro woman, mother. He lived an impoverished life and was locked down, was looked down upon because he was a mixed race. But he never became resentful. He always referred to himself like, as a slave, like St. Paul says, I am a slave of Christ. In 1962, Pope John XXIII remarked that of Martin, he excused the faults of others, he forgave the bitterness, bitterest injuries, convinced that he deserved much severe punishment on account of his own sins. He tried with all his might to redeem the guilty. Lovingly, he comforted the sick, he provided food, clothing, and medicine for the poor. He helped as best he could, farm laborers and Negroes, as well as mulattoes who were looked upon at that time as akin to slaves. Thus he deserved to be called by the people Martin of Charity. So it was said that he was able to, um, to actually um, communicate with animals. But that was the least of it. Among the many miracles attributed to St. Martin de Porres were those of levitation, so he would actually levitate off the ground, by location, meaning he could be in two places at one time, miraculous knowledge, instantaneous cures, and ability to communicate with animals. So this is the part I was talking about, about his clothing. So word of his miracles had made him known as a saint throughout the region. And so as his body's being displayed to allow the people of the city to pay their respects, each person snipped a tiny piece of his habit. And as it turned out, they had to put two more habits on him because people kept cutting it off of him. So he actually had, while he was laying in state, had three habits put on. That's how, that's how um, prominent he was. And he was like, you know, he was a servant, and he had a servant's heart. So he's like a model. He's a perfect model for us. And that's why I picked St. Martin de Porres uh, for tonight. So there I have his relic there as well. So I got a question. And the question is, um, the question I asked you, the, the two questions that I asked you at the beginning. What would your definition of a saint be? Anybody want to offer up what their definition would be? 
Um, I put down someone who has given their life over to God. Okay. Yeah, no, definitely. Who else? Anybody? Okay, so what does it take to be a saint? I actually gave you the answer at the very beginning. What does it take to be a saint? So what did every saint possess at the moment of their death? Holiness, that's because of the other answer. Pardon? Yeah, so that holiness, that communion is grace within them, right? Every person that is a saint in heaven died in the state of grace. So the question really is, how do we ensure that we remain in the state of grace? Because we really have no idea when our life will end. So remaining in the state of grace ultimately is the most important thing to us, right? We know the answer if we think about the end of the act of contrition, at least the one that I had to memorize when I was a kid and I still use, right? Oh my God, I'm heartily sorry for having offended thee. I detest all of my sins because of thy just punishment, but most of all because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love. And I firmly resolve with the help of God, with the grace of God, to sin no more and to avoid near occasion of sin. So, how do we remain in the state of grace? To sin no more and to avoid near occasion of sin. I offer this to you because it really matters. Because every person who is in heaven is a saint, is all holy. How did they get there? By the help of God's grace. How do we stay in God's grace? By sinning no more and avoiding the near occasion of sin. What do you think is the number one enemy or the destroyer of God's grace? What is a total destroyer of God's grace in our life? Mortal sin. You're right. So what is mortal sin? It's an intentional act that is of grave matter and done with full knowledge and consent. So think of the, the Ten Commandments. What is the number one enemy of mortal sin? Reconciliation. It is contrition, repentance, reparation, and the true desire not to sin again. Because through reconciliation, the gravest of sins can be forgiven. Now I know, without asking anybody here, I know that there are some of us here who haven't, haven't been to reconciliation in a long time. I cannot impress upon you enough the importance of staying in a state of grace. There's nothing more important than that. There's nothing more important to us as parents to help our children understand that there's nothing more important than staying in a state of grace. So remember this, this is good news, that remember that every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. The state of grace is available to everyone. So we need to avail ourselves of it. So let us praise God in our day and in our night, and let's wake up in the morning and do the same.